My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Whether to speak the word, whether to speak your own word, whether to speak what you feel like, whether to speak what you desire, but you must understand the mystery of speaking. John chapter 1 verse number 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning, when all creations were absent, and God was left alone. And no one knows where God appeared from. So we are talking about the ageless times. When angels didn't exist. When man didn't exist. When trees were nowhere to be found. He says in those ageless times, there was one that was with God. And when you look at the Greek meaning of the with and the word was with God. It means that the word stood before God. The word stood in front of God. And the word was with him until God decided to begin to make things. And the Bible says that there was nothing made that was made without the word. It looks like the only companion God had from eternity past eternity presence and eternity future is something called words and then when we look at the concept of creation we see how god made good use of all that he had with him before he started creating he didn't have to reach out to any other thing the bible said god created the heavens and the earth in the beginning god will never make anything that is chaotic so whatever happened to earth until the second creation was done only god knows but we know that the prophets ezekiel and the rest gives us a glimpse jeremiah also gives us a glimpse that there was there was an existence before genesis chapter 1 verse number 2 and he said that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the earth and the spirit of the lord moved upon the face of the earth and then the verse number three the bible said and god said so now after things were messed up and god wanted to create again god wanted to restructure life again he reached out to that which has been with him from the beginning. Words. Then he began to speak words. So that words would bring order one more time. So that words would produce new things again. If you read Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 3, it talks about it. That by faith... We believe and we know that these wells were framed by the word of God. And the things that we see came out of things that has never been seen. So we see from scriptures that when God wanted to create new things, he spoke. And then he didn't just create the new things. He spoke to the new things so that the new things will function in the purpose for which it was created the bible said he created the firmament and he said to the firmament separate the waters above from the waters beneath purpose he created the greater light and the lesser light and he said this shall be for days for seasons and this will separate day from night and the sun has been working from genesis chapter one till today 
so if the father did not just use words he used words to bring establishment dominion then when it got to man in verse 26 of genesis 1 the bible said he said let us make man in our own image and not just in our image but in our likeness by image we know god sees so he has eyes by image we know that god has hands therefore we also have hands so we look like him in that perspective he has feet and we look at ourselves and we also have feet so we look like his image but the question is what is it about god's nature that we look like he didn't just say we will we, he should create us in his image in his likeness in his nature also then genesis chapter 1 uh, chapter 1 verse 1 to verse 25 gives us the nature with which god revealed in creation so if god wants you to be like him in nature then he gives us a glimpse of how he operates to make things work and we saw one thing about god somebody says speaking the man kept speaking words speaking words and he was meticulous in everything he was saying to make sure that everything he was saying was introducing something to this world to bring order to the formless world we are studying who this god is my job is to teach you until you become like jesus and you can never neglect the mystery of speaking and still boast that you are like jesus there is something about words that you can't separate from who god is then he reveals the nature that man must adapt from him and he reveals it through the process of creation and god said and god said and god said and after he created man in his image he decided to bless man then he uses the same concept the bible said and god blessed the male and female and said multiply subdue the earth and have dominion over the, the bears of the air over the fishes of the sea over the the, the cattle that walk through the, the the field he said and god said have dominion so he gives us the blessing he gives both the male and the female the blessing of dominion but he shows us how that blessing is going to operate in a man if he gave it to you by speaking then you should also exercise it by speaking then by genesis chapter 2 verse number 7 everything that he did in genesis chapter 1 it seems and it looks so plainly that it was a spiritual affair then he decides to transfer everything into the physical realm so that everything that is in the spirit can be handled in the physical then the bible said he made the heavens and the earth but there was no man on the earth therefore no plant has also appeared and dew were just falling and in the verse 7 the bible said he took the dust of the ground and he formed the man please hear me this is where the message is he formed the man and he breathed into the man i'm telling you how you can walk like your father here on earth he breathed into the man then the bible said verse 7 of genesis chapter 2 so that everybody can read and he said man became a living soul somebody say a living soul man became a living soul and most of us just accept everything that comes to us yes man became a living soul man became a living soul and the question is that what is it about man that makes him living is it the breathing if it is the breathing 
then animals also breathe so what is it about man that made him the living soul then you 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 always have to try and search into how god spoke and how the original version was given and when you look into the primitive word in the hebrew language of living soul living soul it is kalfa it comes from two words kalfa and kalfa means that a man became kalfa that means man became a speaking spirit that is how come he made many things at a time but have you realized that animals has got kidneys they've got liver they've got heart some have hands some have teeth they have almost everything we have but there is one thing they don't have the ability to speak they have the ability to make noise but they don't have the ability to compose statements that can evoke dominion noise don't command power it is meaningful words that commands power that is the nature of god he god didn't just make noise he spoke with specificity let there be light and there was light let there be this and there was that and the bible said he will see and say it is good that is a process of life speaking comes before seeing he spoke light light appeared the bible said he saw that it was good the system in our humanity is that we wait to see something so we say it is good but the system of god is that speaking makes you first a human being you speak it then you manifest and you see it and you see something that it is good and this is where humans received our with uniqueness and to make it more dangerous and to help humans exercise more dominion by speaking the bible said god formed things from the dust the cattle the herbs he formed everything from the dust and the bible said he presented it to man now try your dominion i told you i will give you dominion over the bears over the cattle over the plants i'll give you dominion over them but this is how the dominion is going to be exercised i have made a lion this is a lion now if i declare the lion a lion the lion must respond to me but i am going to allow you adam exercise your speaking power and the bible said that whatsoever name that is the secret the bible said whatsoever name adam called the cattles that was the name thereof listen listen to me that was the name thereof and you know the name in the hebrew there means shem and the and the meaning of shem means that character authority honor so when god said that whatsoever adam called it that was the name thereof that means that whatsoever character adam placed on it that was it whatsoever honor adam placed on it that was am i here with the church at all people don't just listen all that god was saying is that adam you have the authority to make things happen by speaking and i give you the opportunity over all creation now whatever name in other words when you mention the name that will be the characteristics of that thing the bible says in genesis chapter 3 verse 20 that an adam called his wife eve and said because you are the mother of all living things this is how i choose to name you because this is how i choose to make you be i'm leading you there i just want you to know that that attitude of speaking anyhow is your problem when god spoke the bible said he saw that it was good but you see at a point in time instead of man speaking god's words man began to speak by their own understanding after man ate the fruit man began to operate by his own understanding because the spirit inside the man has been corrupted so men began to speak unto death 
men began to speak unto destruction. Men began to speak unto condemnation. Men began to speak unto strife. Then the word of God that man has missed. I made you a speaking spirit so that you will share with me in speaking forth the word that has been with me from the beginning. But when the wisdom of men were corrupted, do you know why Adam named everything and the Bible said that that was the name thereof? That means that Adam could tap into the manifold wisdom of God to know because there is no way God will make a creation and not know the name. So as Adam was naming them, he was not speaking differently from what God is thinking. But when his spirit was corrupted, this time in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, and the imaginations of men were evil. And we all know that as a man thinketh, so is he. So man began to speak for the evil imaginations. Then God said, I have already made them in my image and in my likeness. Something must be done so that I can bring them back to speaking like me. So what must be done? The word that is with me from the beginning must come forth as flesh and blood and dwell among men and pay the penalty of all the wrong speakings of men and all the imaginations of men and all the evils of men. Then men can be renewed in spirit again so that they can speak like me according to my word and then the word became flesh and died and resurrected then in john chapter 20 verse number 22 and he said and when he has said this he breathed on oh he breathed on genesis chapter 2 he breathed and man became he resurrected a new creation is coming in my likeness and in my image again and there also he breathed and said to them receive the holy ghost this time it's not just your speaking spirit it is the speaking spirit of god and they received the holy ghost and he said tarry here because the mandate is about to hit you and after 40 days they were in the upper room in one accord in one place and the bible said that there came a rushing mighty wind the, the breath is coming there came a rushing mighty wind it fell on them as cloven tongues of fire and the bible said they received utterance how come the spirit came as fire and he didn't give them anything but speaking ability they received utterance when you understand this message you begin to tell yourself thank God I'm saved the spirit of old which was dead has been making us speak the wrong things but this new spirit after the breathing of Jesus has come and he gives them utterance and that's that spirit has a ministry of speaking he says that he that is sent of God speak the words of God for he has been given the spirit without measure in other words if you want to know anybody on assignment from god this is the sign anyone that is sent of god speak not their own words they speak the word of god because they have been given the spirit so the assignment of the holy spirit is to supply you with words moment by moment words that are from god this scripture john the baptist used to expose everyone that says he is called by god if you are called by god where is your word if you are sent by god where is your word and this is also a sign of who is saying that the holy spirit is with him the proof of the holy spirit in a person's life is the person's ability to speak words that are from god is the person's ability to wake up in the morning and to know the words to say and those words are in line with the word god wants to declare for the day i pray 
that may the Holy Spirit be activated in your life to supply you with words, daily words, words of living waters. On the other day, the disciples of Jesus were living. And Jesus turned in John chapter 6. He turned to Peter and said, Will you people also go? Then Peter looks at Jesus and said, To whom do we go to? For you have the words of eternal life. You have the words. It's your possession. And he said, for we believe that you are the son of God. You are the Christ. This is, look, look at it. This is, some people believe you because of miracles. But we believe you by the word you preach. That you have the words of eternal life. This is why we have no one else to go to. Thank God for everything he does. But you, you, why are you in this church? If it's not because of the word, you have missed it. John the Baptist said that he that is sent of God, speak the word because the spirit is given to him without measure. So the spirit supplies the words. Then Jesus makes it more deeper. He says that for the flesh profited nothing. He said, you have been following me, but I want to tell you, my flesh profited nothing. But these words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life that means that to jesus words are not just something the holy spirit supplies words is the holy spirit himself these words i speak they are spirit and you look at this these things about the holy spirit and you realize that if a believer misses this opportunity then you don't look like God. You can never exercise the the dominion mandate that the Lord gave. It is your ability to speak and not just to speak anything, but to speak the words that God also speaks. Jesus said, the Father loves the Son. For whatsoever He doeth, He loves the Son. Therefore, He makes the Son see whatsoever He doeth. And Jesus said, and the son also do likewise so jesus didn't come to just preach whatever he wanted it is whatsoever he had isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 talks about it he said early in the morning he opened my ears and he filled them with wisdom and he said he has given me the tongue of a learned so he didn't just come to preach parables they were words he heard early in the morning. No wonder the Bible will say early in the morning, Jesus will rise up and go and pray. A great while before day, he will go and pray. He knew what he was getting. He was getting worse every morning. Ah, may you receive the same grace. The Bible says that a man that offended not in words, the same is a perfect man. A man, and he said that such a man is able to put his body in order. The man who has learned how to speak the right words. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that when Jesus was describing the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he said that he is the spirit of truth and he will guide you into all truth. That is worse. He would teach you what to say. When God spoke, the Bible said he saw that it was good. But you see, at a point in time, instead of man speaking God's words, man began to speak by their own understanding. After man ate the fruit, man began to operate by his own understanding because the spirit inside the man has been corrupted so men began to speak unto death men began to speak unto destruction men began to speak unto condemnation men began to speak unto strife. then the word of God that man has missed I made you a speaking spirit 
so that you will share with me in speaking forth the word that has been with me from the beginning but when the wisdom of men were corrupted do you know why adam named everything and the bible said that that was the name thereof that means that adam could tap into the manifold wisdom of god to know because there is no way god will make a creation and not know the name so as adam was naming them he was not speaking differently from what god is thinking but when his spirit was corrupted this time in genesis chapter 6 the bible says and the imaginations of men were evil and we all know that as a man thinketh, so you see so man began to speak for the evil imaginations then god said i have already made them in my image and in my likeness something must be done so that i can bring them back to speaking like me so what must be done the word that is with me from the beginning must come forth as flesh and blood and dwell among men and pay the penalty of all the wrong speakings of men and all the imaginations of men and all the evils of men then men can be renewed in spirit again so that they can speak like me according to my word and then the word became flesh and died and resurrected then in john chapter 20 verse number 22 and he said and when he has said this he breathed on oh he breathed on genesis chapter 2 he breathed and man became he resurrected a new creation is coming in my likeness and in my image again and there also he breathed and said to them receive the holy ghost this time it's not just your speaking spirit it is the speaking spirit of god and they received the holy ghost and he said tarry here because the mandate is about to hit you and after 40 days they were in the upper room in one accord in one place and the bible said that there came a rushing mighty wind the, the breath is coming there came a rushing mighty wind it fell on them as clothing tongues of fire and the bible said they received utterance how come the spirit came as fire and he didn't give them anything but speaking ability they received utterance when you understand this message you begin to tell yourself thank god i'm saved the spirit of old which was dead has been making us speak the wrong things but this new spirit after the breathing of jesus has come and he gives them utterance and that that spirit has a ministry of speaking he says that he that is sent of god speaketh the words of god for he has been given the spirit without measure in other words if you want to know anybody on assignment from god this is the sign anyone that is sent of god speak it not their own words they speak the word of god because they have been given the spirit so the assignment of the holy spirit is to supply you with words moment by moment words that are from god this scripture john the baptist used to expose everyone that says he is called by god if you are called by god where is your word if you are sent by god where is your word and this is also a sign of who is saying that the holy spirit is with him the proof of the holy spirit in a person's life is the person's ability to speak words that are from god is the person's ability to wake up in the morning and to know the words to say and those words are in line with the word god wants to declare for the day i pray that may the holy spirit be activated in your life to supply you with words daily words words of living waters on the other day the disciples of jesus were living 
and Jesus turned in John chapter 6 he turned to Peter and said will you people also go then Peter looks at Jesus and said to whom do we go to for you have the words of eternal life you have the words it's your possession and he said for we believe that you are the son of god you are the christ this is look look at it this is some people believe you because of miracles but we believe you by the word you preach that you have the words of eternal life this is why we have no one else to go to thank god for everything he does but you you why are you in this church if it's not because of the word you have missed it john the baptist said that he that is sent of god speaketh the word because the spirit is given to him without measure so the spirit supplies the words then jesus makes it more deeper he says that for the flesh profited nothing he said you have been following me but i want to tell you my flesh profited nothing but these words i speak to you they are spirit and they are life that means that to jesus words are not just something the holy spirit supplies words is the holy spirit himself these words i speak they are spirit and you look at this these things about the holy spirit and you realize that if a believer misses this opportunity then you don't look like god you can never exercise the the dominion mandate that the lord gave it is your ability to speak and not just to speak anything but to speak the words that god also speaks Oh, Jesus said, the father loves the son. For whatsoever he doeth, he loves the son. Therefore, he makes the son see whatsoever he doeth. And Jesus said, and the son also do likewise. So Jesus didn't come to just preach whatever he wanted. It is whatsoever he had. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 talks about it. He said, early in the morning, he opened my ears and he filled them with wisdom. And he said, he has given me the tongue of a learned. So he didn't just come to preach parables. They were words he heard early in the morning. No wonder the Bible will say early in the morning, Jesus will rise up and go and pray. A great while before day, he will go and pray. He knew what he was getting. He was getting worse every morning ah may you receive the same grace the bible says that a man that offended not in words the same is a perfect man a man and he said that such a man is able to put his body in order the man who has learned how to speak the right words and that is the ministry of the holy spirit do you know that when jesus was describing the ministry of the holy spirit he said that he is the spirit of truth and he will guide you into all truth that is worse he will teach you what to say you are as powerful as the things you say the only time silence is powerful is when you don't have the right words to say if you don't have the right words to say keep silent but if you have the right words to say don't keep silent because that is your dominion mandate the only time the angel muted Zachariah and made him dumb was when Zachariah attempted to speak things that a priest shouldn't say my wife is old I'm also old how can this be and the angel said I stand before the presence of God if Mary will say this and go scot free not you if unbelievers will speak anyhow, it is unforgivable for believers to also speak anyhow. You must understand the power of words. Have you ever thought of how you were saved? The Bible says that if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he died and rose again. And sometimes we have been taught 
from a traditional perspective to a point that the moment we hear confession, confess, confess, that means confess your sin. That's not what the Bible says. He didn't say confess your sins. He said confess the Lord Jesus. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. You are my Lord. You just confess your salvation. Listen, people have taught us what is not in the Bible and we have held it as traditions. Do you know why you must confess Jesus is Lord and he died and rose up again? Do you know why? Because you cannot remember all your sins from the day you were born to today. You can't remember. You have been sinning so much. But on the cross, all your sins were put on him. So many times you confess him, you are confessing all your sins. You are declaring all your sins at a time in that one man. And do, and do you even know the, the Greek meaning of the confess day? The Greek meaning of the confess day means homologia. Homologia. It means to repeat what has been done. What was done 2,020 years ago? It was a man that hung on the cross. And all the sins of the world was put on him. Until he began to cry out, My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Because the sins of the world was upon him. And the father has turned his eyes away from him. But don't thank God on the third day. He resurrected again unto our justification. And unto our righteousness. And when we confess his death, we confess his resurrection. And we declare that on the cross we were for with him. But when he resurrected, we have risen in righteousness. Somebody give him some praise. Give him some praise. We must, we must understand the things we say. So many people don't even know that when they sing songs like, Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. Why, wow, sorry, Ephraim. They don't know all their sins have been forgiven at that time. They don't know they are being saved at that time. Somebody shout, thank you, Lord Jesus. I believe you died and rose up again. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Listen, believe it, believe it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Why have you been given such a precious gift? And you don't even use it for the right purpose. You keep gossiping with this tongue. You don't even use it for what will bring good upon the land. You keep using it to curse when you should be using it to repeat what God has done. What has he done? By his stripes, ye were healed. Homologia means repeat it. Repeat it. Don't repeat what the devil is doing. Repeat what Jesus has done. Don't repeat the evil dream you had. Repeat what God has done. Don't repeat the curses of your grandmother 30 years ago. Repeat the blessings of the cross 2020 years ago. Repeat it. Somebody say from today, I refuse to repeat what the devil is doing, what evil powers are doing. I, re I refuse to repeat what is happening around me. I repeat what Jesus has done. I declare his lordship i declare his death i declare his resurrection give him a shout of praise. on the other day jesus told them he said that if you are going before the council don't even premeditate for the holy spirit will put words in your mouth that even your adversaries cannot gain say he will put words please if the holy spirit put words in your mouth don't keep silent because you fear the one standing with you there are some of you the holy spirit keeps saying that you are about to see blessings keep shouting it even when everybody is doubting you If the Holy Spirit is imprinting in your mouth that declare that this year you will marry, keep declaring. Even when you don't even have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, keep declaring. Speak in line with the Spirit. Speak in line. 
The Bible says that there is no private interpretation to the prophecy as the old prophets spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So everybody has the capacity to be inspired by the Holy Spirit until the words that comes are full of grace and full of salt. Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 29 talks about it. That impact, edify with your words. Edify with your words. Edify with your words. Job says 25, how forceful are right words. How forceful. They carry power. They carry power. Solomon said, words spoken rightly are like apples of gold in baskets of silver. Right words. Speak it forth. The time you must keep silent is when you are angry. Don't talk. If you have to speak, to speak words that destroys, you, are, you look more like hell than God. Have you not read James chapter 3? It talks about it. He said that the tongue is a little element in the body, but it can set the life on the course of hell. It's a world of iniquity. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is the whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. Your tongue can corrupt your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. So whenever hell, the gate of hell wants to invade the man, the part of the man that he invades is his tongue. It says that it sets on fire by hell itself. So when the gate of hell wants to attack a person, it attacks the tongue of the person. And the tongue of the person sets the whole life on fire. Somebody say, Lord, help us. I've made errors before. I've spoken out of grief. I know you have. We've all made errors. We've all said things we shouldn't have said. But there is always room for repentance. Knowing who you are. That this is what makes you unique from all creation. Your ability to speak the right things. And how do you do that? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, he gave words. He gave utterance. He that is sent of God. Speak at the word of God. Because the Spirit is given to him without measure. The Holy Spirit is always supplying words. I've seen it. I have experienced it. I remember a young boy who was to go to school and everything shows that i was i was to be the one to sponsor the education because the mother didn't have anything then i held the hands of the boy and i said lord you know i am not financially sound at that time to also handle this case i held the hand of the boy words started coming from my mouth i started speaking things i've never thought of i spoke over the boy and i paid the first school fees second term in secondary school the boy was there waiting to be sacked he was not sacked. Another time has come. And then the headmistress calls the boy and tells the boy, there is a thick, tall man. Your father has been coming here. Some of you remember that testimony. Your father has been coming here to come and pay everything. And he's saying that if there is any debt, we should give it to you. And if you need money, we should give it to you. And he will keep coming to pay every debt. That is it. And that is how the boy completed secondary school. And never saw the man never saw the man but the man paid everything I, sometimes when the boy comes i try to tell the boy no no i can't believe this and the boy will show me receipts of payment meanwhile he has never seen the man this is not a book i read this is a testimony in our church there was a girl that epilepsy was tormenting and embarrassing our whole services every time she will come to church the the epilepsy will come like three times every week and every time she will come to church epilepsy will happen and because of that this girl's family didn't take care of her the the boy that impregnated her every, she ran away this girl was not having anybody to take care of her and she cannot work because of this infirmity the one day it happened in service i quickly closed service i went to the girl laid my hands on her suddenly some words started coming listen to me i'm telling you about how you can avail yourself for the holy spirit to put words that will change people's lives and change your own life i don't know where the words were coming from i said lord it looks like i pity this girl more than you pity her i didn't know that was blasphemous 
I, I, I knew I was blaspheming. That was blasphemous. I can't love a, a person more than God. But the words were coming. I said, from today, this church will not have my offerings again. This church will not have my tithe again. After every service, I will give my tithe and my offering to this girl. If God, you will not heal her. People of God, that was the last time the epilepsy showed up. That was the last time. I remember when I was saying those words, I was crying. And that was how God healed her. And her whole family came to me. And I remember they came, they bowed down on their feet. They thanked me. And I've been asking about her. And that thing has not showed up again. It's been more than four years. Listen, there are times that worse can be born. Don't speak like a child of the devil. Don't speak like somebody who comes from a poor family. Don't speak like somebody who has failed in life. Don't speak like somebody who is weak. Speak like a child of God. Don't speak like a man. Speak like somebody born of God. They that are born of God overcome it, the world. And this is their victory. Even their faith. Let me close you with this. I remember some time ago, it was a Saturday night. I was preparing for service. Then Daniel began to cry. And he doesn't like crying. But this time, nothing will stop him. Nothing will stop him. His mother tried everything. So I got disturbed. I stopped what I was doing. And to try to engage him. And the boy would not stop crying. He continued for more than 30 to 40 minutes. For nothing will console the boy. Then I bowed my head. And the Lord said, lay your hands on him. And I thought I was going to lay my hands. To begin to say, Lord, touch Lord, do this. The moment I obeyed the Holy Spirit, laid my hands on the boy, what came out of my mouth is, Devil, leave the boy now. How long did it take him? In less than a minute. That's how the boy started running about and playing. Listen to me. No, listen to me. Listen to me. This was worse. Do you know the things you must be speaking to? That you have been silent all this while? Some of you are crying for nothing. Change the way you talk. You are a child of God. Speak in line with God. Let grace fill your heart. Don't talk like a worldly person. Do you know how you became a speaking spirit? God breathe. Then that breath is the power of God inside you to enable you to speak. And you are using the power of God to declare destruction. And do my ass say, you were speaking from the breath of God. She said, they are sorry, I You were speaking from the breath of God. You are wasting God's breath. Today, church was not powerful. Church was not powerful. You just wasted the breath. Do you know what it means for a church to be powerful? It's not falling down. It's God imparting you. It's an encounter. That encounter is more than physical manifestations. Let the weak say, Much more than we've asked, we are persuaded you will do and your name will be glorified. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Wow. That was powerful. I think we'll start doing more of the sax worship. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ha 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 ha
Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, in the precious name of Jesus, and welcome to Bible study. We were instructed of the Lord to take out our Tuesday sessions and establish truths along the lines of basic foundations. There are so many things to consider in this season, but it's also important for us to have a thorough understanding of what the foundational truths of our faith, the emphasis that the fathers worked with, the things that we are built on. It's important for us to clearly understand these things and understand them to the point that they become our predominant consciousness. You can pray, join a prayer group and pray for a month or two and start having visions, and angelic encounters, receiving prophetic words, and it may contradict your life and destroy you because you don't have foundational knowledge. And so it's important for us to take it precept upon precept, lines upon lines, and establish the bedrock of our belief system. And this is what we've been doing in the last two months. We started by considering the subject of salvation. We looked into that. And then we also considered the subject of the new creation. The man who is born again, how does God see him? We're done dealing with that. And then we went into the subject of um, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We dealt with that. We delved into evangelism. And then now we want to go a bit further. And tonight I will talk to us briefly about growing onto spiritual maturity, coming into maturity what it entails to be a mature believer so you will focus and um, build your life along these lines. This is a very sensitive subject and I give you three reasons why it's very sensitive. It may not be very emotional, it may not be very energetic, but this is the bedrock of your Christianity. How far you go depends on the degree to which your life becomes a model or an expression of the things I'll be sharing tonight. How far you will go in this kingdom. If you don't conform to this portrait, you may be very gifted but you may not be relevant. The subject of maturity is very important because number one, authority in this kingdom is a function of maturity. Authority is different from the anointing, classically speaking, and I explain to you why. I understand that the anointing confers authority, but you can be anointed and not, be, and not have authority with God. Because anointing helps you to accomplish feats on the face of the earth. But authority beyond accomplishing feats on the face of the earth gives you approval before God. An anointed man can be rejected of God. But a man that has authority has approval with God. Two of us, two persons can pray for the sick and the sick is healed. One can operate it from the premise of the anointing. The other can operate it from the premise of authority. A man who is anointed does not care about the will of God. He just wants to perform and get the job done. And because the anointing is there, the anointing will get the job done. But when a man under authority is functioning... He is not just producing results. Everything you see, he do, he see him do, you will be rest assured that God's approval and seal is upon him. And so in this kingdom, authority is a function of maturity. And only men who have authority can advance the kingdom. An anointed man can be an agent of the devil. And if you, are, if you have been in the body of Christ for a while, you understand what I'm saying. Many apostles today 
have become merchants of the anointing. Take money from people. They literally steal from people. And many persons today cannot believe in God because they met a man of God. Many prophets today have stolen money from people, made a mess of young ladies, and they brought reproach to the name of the Lord. They are anointed, the oil is genuine, but they are not agents of the kingdom. And so for a man to be an ambassador of the kingdom, advancing the frontiers of God's kingdom, he must be a mature believer. Praise God. And so kingdom is only committed to mature people. That is why Galatians chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible said the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant, even though he's lord of all. He said, therefore, God places him under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So only mature believers can advance the kingdom of God, the one that God himself will veto. Number two, maturity is very important because if your work is not vetoed by God, there is no assurance of reward in eternity. You can do so much exploits on earth, but by the time you return to eternity, God can tell you, away from me, you worker of iniquity. So our focus and emphasis is not just what we can do. It's the degree to which God approves of what we do. And if God approves of what we do, then we are persuaded that our labors are not in vain. That means in eternity, there will be a reward for it. So the second reason for spiritual maturity is the fact that it's an insurance policy that procures reward for you eternally. Number three, the reason why maturity is important is, the, is that a man can only be an ambassador of this kingdom when he's mature. That means character and the abilities of the spirit must be balanced. The reason you find people fighting the church today is not necessarily because they hate God. It's because they can't trust the men that claim to represent God anymore. When mature believers appear on the scene, true ambassadors of the kingdom will be born. True witnesses will be born and it will become easier for us to take our word. So it's important to be mature because only mature believers can advance the kingdom. It's important to be mature because only mature believers can be assured of reward in eternity. Because when God comes to award us in eternity, he will check the motives for what we do, not just what we do as it were. And then thirdly, maturity is important because only truly mature believers can be ambassadors of this kingdom. That's why Paul, speaking to Timothy, he said, exhort not a novice. He said, lest when he is lifted, he will fall into the condemnation of the devil. So many have brought reproach to the name of the Lord. And the reason is because they are not mature. So you find babies talking about mighty things of the kingdom, but when you check their lives, their lives is an opposite of what they affirm. Somebody is talking about character. While he's yet speaking, you can see a lot of character flaws. And so you look at them, you say, who are these drama kings? Somebody is talking about purity, and you check his life, there's nothing to write to him about. Somebody is talking about integrity, but is full of vanity. And so we are saying what people want to hear, but our life is a complete departure from the things we say. And because this has become the order of the day, the name of the Lord is being ridiculed in our generation. So the subject of maturity is prime, and it's important for us to examine it. And that's what we want to do tonight, to find out what spiritual maturity is about. But before I venture into that, the first thing I want to say is that maturity is not a gift. Maturity is developed through process. And so you don't consider a gifted man a mature man just because he has a gift to show. When you want to find a mature man, the point of emphasis is character. Maturity is not a gift. I read a few scriptures to you quickly as we begin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 4, I'll be reading some of these scriptures so that um, it sits with us. I will not be quoting them speedily as I, would, as I would on a normal day. Paul was speaking to the church in Corinth. And if you have studied your New Testament, you would, you would know that um, the church in Corinth 
is the most gifted church Paul ever pastored. It was in the church in Corinth, Paul taught about the nine gifts of the Spirit. But when you also look at that book of the Bible, that's where most of the character flaws were observed. That means most times, the most gifted amongst us are actually the most immature. It's not so in all cases, but most of the times when you find gifted people, you will discover they didn't pay, they hardly pay attention to character development. It's not that mature people don't have character, don't have, don't have gifts, but I'm telling you, you have to be careful when you are dealing with a gifted man. Because many times, their life is hinged on their gifts. And they think because they are gifted, God depends on them. But it's a joke. When you check the scriptures, you discover the last thing God considers is a gift. A gift will not procure reward. A gift will not give you approval with God. A gift will not give you approval with men. It's character that does that. Praise God. And so Paul talking to this church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 4 to verse 6, he said, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Christ Jesus that in everything ye are enriched in him in all utterance. This is a church that had so much utterance they could communicate the counsel of God. When you hear them speak, you wonder whether they live in heaven. He said, this church is enriched in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Three things Paul mentioned. Number one was utterance. They had the capacity to seize an angel. Before he says, an angel is standing there, the next person will say, that angel is a cherubim. And the next one will say, that angel is carrying a sword. He wants to destroy the sons of the born woman. So the prophetic, they were so excellent. It's not this kind of church where somebody is seeing an angel, he says on the right, the other one says on the left. I'm not talking assumption. They had cutting edge dimension of gifts. This is a church where they could hold your leg and pull it out. And you will see bones grow out. It, it was natural. And when you study the church in Corinth, there are people living by the riverside. They were uneducated people, peasants that Paul brought the power of God to and when they saw it, they pursued the power. And so Paul acknowledged the fact that they had knowledge, they had utterance, and they had gifts. But when you look at chapter 3 of this same scripture from verse 1, talking to this same church, here was Paul's remark concerning their state of maturity. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Can a man be gifted and not spiritual? How can you be operating in the prophetic and you are not spiritual? How can you be operating in the miraculous and you are not spiritual? Because when Paul is talking about spirituality in its original sense, he's talking about your ability to walk in light. And walking in light means walking in the word of God. If you are not walking in the word of God, if the word of God does not dictate for your mind, dictate for your emotions, and dictate for your actions. You may be seeing angels, but you are not spiritual. You are spiritual when the word of God becomes a dictator to your emotions, to your mind, and to your actions. If you are not regulated by the word of God, you have a spiritual gift, you are not spiritual. So Paul said, I could not speak unto you as spiritual. He said, but as unto Cana. How can a healer be carnal? You know what it means to raise a cripple from which years? Can a carnal man raise a cripple from which years? Yes, that's what Paul is teaching us. Because when you find that man later, he's not under the government of the word of God. So he can raise men from which year, and that very minute, he uses that action to raise money. Because he knows that seeing that power, the people have become vulnerable. And he will merchandise them immediately. Praise God. Are you following? He said you are carnal and he went further to say you are babes. He said I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. You were not able before. Now too you are not able. And in verse 3 he said for you are carnal. And he began to draw out one of two things that he saw. That made him confirm that they were carnal, even though they were highly gifted. He said, For whereas there is among you envying 
strife, divisions. He said, are you not Kana? Are you not walking as men? There is strife. There is envy. There is division. So you come to this kind of church. If somebody comes up today and a cripple walks, the next brother goes on 40 days fast. It's not because he loves God. If this guy raises cripples and people are following him, the next time I come, unless the dead rises. If the dead does not rise, then I'm not an apostle. So the reason he went on 40 days fast is not because of God. It's because of the contention and competition that exists between them. This brother is singing, people fall under the anointing. The next one that comes up, if people are not falling, he will break the roof that day. You will literally know that this is the energy of the flesh. If something happens to one, the other enters a spiritual campaign. It has nothing to do with God. This is why you find that people doing a lot of things today, there is no authority. It's jamboree. It's contention. It's strife. It's competition. You find division everywhere. It's impossible for them to coexist in harmony. Today, one is fighting, I belong to Paul. Another one is fighting, I belong to Apollos. Another one is fighting, I belong to Cephas. And Paul came to them and said, did Paul die for you? You know, when they are doing this thing, they feel they are so spiritual. How dare you, Apollos? Do you know when Paul gave his heart to Christ? Who told you you have as much stature as Paul? You two are talking when Paul is talking. And as they are fighting for Paul, they think they are serving God. Paul came, he said, it's carnality of the highest order. Those fighting for Paul thought Paul would be impressed and say they are fighting for him. When he came, he said, shut up. I'm not Jesus. I didn't die for you. And the gospel is not for you to fight to defend me. The other shows up and says, no. All these old preachers, they want to shut down the, the voice of the small preachers. And they are talking everywhere. They think they are fighting for the young believers. Paul said, quit it. He said, that's carnality. That's babyhood Christianity. He said, when you become mature, there will be no strife. There will be no division. When you become mature, you will be able to co and coexist together. Because when you see the early church, the first of all were together. They migrated from being together, they became in one accord. And then they migrated from being in one accord, they came to singleness of heart. In Luke 24, 49, it says, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. So they were together in the upper room. When the Holy Ghost came in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, they migrated from being together, they were in one accord. To be together is to be in the same location and agree. To be in one accord is to understand one another. So when somebody insults you, you know that he's insulting you because he doesn't know better. When somebody accuses you, you don't need to kill yourself to prove yourself. You just allow it for the interest of peace. You have migrated from just agreeing, now you can understand why things happen the way they happen. And then you move from there, you come to the place of singleness of heart. Where those things don't exist anymore. Everybody has have grown. Praise God. Are we together? Paul is saying, if these things are not there, you are not mature. And if you are not mature, you can't do kingdom business. He said, you are walking as men. You think you are spiritual men. He said, but in real sense, you are actually ordinary carnal men who are babes in the things of the spirit. And he said, ideally, I would have loved to speak with you deep things. He said, but I can't talk to you. I can only give you milk because you are babes. What then is maturity? If prophecy is not maturity, if raising the dead is not maturity, if healing the sick is not maturity, what then is maturity? Before I delve into it, I show you a few scriptures that let you know that it's possible to walk in maturity. Number one, Matthew 5, 48. The Bible said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect, which is in heaven. The word perfect, as used in this scripture, or in this context, is the word teleos. There are two words for maturity you will find in the New Testament. The first is teleos. And the second is katatizo. And I explain to you what teleos is quickly before I talk about katatizo. There are four definitions of the word teleos, which is what perfection or maturity is in the spirit. Number one is to be brought to an end or to be finished. So when the Bible said be a perfect, what it meant is that 
come to the end of your development so that there is no other area where devel development is necessary or needed. Number two, definition of the word teleos means wanting nothing to be complete. Wanting nothing. That means you have come to a point where you don't require any further discipline to be humble. You don't require any further suffering in the flesh to be broken. If it's on the area of brokenness, you have seen what it means to be broken. God doesn't need to expose you to any level of suffering to break you anymore. You have come to completion. The third definition is becoming a consummate man in integrity and in virtue. That's what it means when it says be perfect. The word tell you to be a consummate man in integrity and in virtue. That means when you find this man, if he says stand, you can stand. If he says it is done, he will kill himself for it to be done. His words cannot fall to the ground. As touching integrity, his, his word is his bond. I'm showing you this so you understand where our Christianity is. This is a gross departure. In the 80s, we heard stories. We were told that many companies, when they are looking for accountants, they look for deeper lifers. Because you don't need a CCTV. If a deeper lifer tells you, Go, 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 go. But the moment he sees Naira, <laughs> everything we bought, they added at least 300,000 Naira. So you are buying equipment of 28 million, they give you a budget of 52 million. And then you say, Kai, 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 we can't buy equipment now. It's not because the equipment are expensive. When the young man came, I said, I'm a spiritual man. I don't need to probe you. But anything you do will come to light. So after they, they wanted to make payment, the Holy Ghost told me to go to the store. So I said, where are you? He said, it's in area one. That guy, they are working so hard. They are working. So I drove there. I said, I'm, I'm here. The moment I said, I'm here, his blood pressure went high. <laughs> when the people saw me, the terror of God came on them. All of them got confused. I said, no problem, we won't do anything. Let's just pay the right amount and go. When we left, three days later, a huge boy grew on his jaw. <laughs> a huge boy. When we teach on subjects like this, 
It's very important because this is what will restore the dignity and the integrity of the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is being bastardized by those who speak in tongues and manifest the gifts of the Spirit. And it's so sad that today, even those who are genuine can no longer advance the kingdom. I told you my experience is Pakistan. It's not because it's that difficult. It's because I had a Nigerian passport. So if you come with that passport, you are a suspect on arrival. If they are searching people's bag, you, they will take you to radiation room. Meanwhile, the greatest travelers from this country are ministers. If you know the volume of ministers that travel out of this country in one year, you'll be shocked. So, they went out, but they didn't represent Jesus. You see why it's important to understand a subject like this and force yourself to be conformed to it by the grace of God and by the operation of the Holy Spirit. So, the first word for maturity is the word teleos. And it means to be finished. It means to come to a point where you want nothing more. That means you, shouldn't, you can't be improved upon. And then it also means to be a consummate man in integrity and in virtue. And number four, it means to be full grown. To be full grown actually means to function by the word. And the word alone. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, it says, Whoever uses milk is a babe. And it's unskilled in the word of righteousness. He said, but strong meat belongs to them who are of full age, who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern between good and evil. So these ones can put the word of God to work. If you are not able to put the word of God to work, you are still a child. When God started teaching me how to be of full age, then I used to have this migraine headache periodically. And so when I go out to play in the evening and return, a part of my head must ache. I started living on paracetamol. And the Holy Ghost asked me, for how long will you survive on paracetamol? Meanwhile, if you are taking drugs, take drugs. This is personal encounter. And so I started declaring the word of God. I declared the word of God the other day until the pain wouldn't go. I remember the story of a woman that dipped the Bible in the cup of water and drank and, and was healed. So I dipped I dipped a portion of scripture in the, in the water, spoke in tongues, and I drank it. When I drank it, the headache continued. I discovered that was a personal revelation for her. I kept putting the word of God to work, putting the word of God to work, until a point came, the word of God prevailed. And no matter what happens, I don't even remember when last I fell sick. So you come of full age, when you engage the word of God until the word of God begins to speak for you. All of that is captured in the syllables of Tedios. The second word for maturity is the word katatizo. Katatizo simply means to mend and to correct. That means you have come to a point where you are malleable in the hands of God. So God is able to shape you, to mend you and to correct you. That means you are not rigid. Remember, the Bible said you made the word of God of non-effect by your tradition. So there are many people who cannot be corrected. No matter what you say, they said this is the culture of our ancestors. This is how we do it in Nigeria. The Nigerian Christians are not different from the Chinese Christians. All of us have the same faith, the same baptism, the same word of God, the same Holy Spirit. Our, we are not supposed to be defined by traditions. But when it's, it becomes difficult for you to be amended, it means you are a babe. You find Christians, they are hearing the word of God. It's literal, but they say no, they can't take it. You know, because so many things have been bastardized in the body of Christ, many people can no longer be blessed. For example, you can't teach the doctrine and the covenant of prosperity anymore. Because the moment you say money, people switch off. Why is that so? Even though they know that there is something like that in the word of God, they have become stereotyped. No matter what you preach, you can't mend them anymore. They will hear it and say, God bless you and go out. There are certain people, they become lukewarm as touching soul winning. If you like, preach it for one year, they will never go out to win souls. So these kinds of people, they cannot be mended. They cannot be shaped. And so because they are not malleable in the hand of God, they are not mature believers. So katatiso is primarily about transformation, progressive transformation 
or mending by the word of God until you become like the word of God. So when you find a mature believer, he is flexible in the hands of God. Whatever God says, he can align with it. These are the things that are lacking in the church of Corinth that made Paul say, even though you are gifted, you have all utterance, even though you have all knowledge, he say you are babes. Because these things are not there. And if we want a Christianity that can bring the true witness of God to our generation, then the emphasis of maturity must not just be brought on the scene, but our growth process must be oriented in this direction. Praise the name of the Lord. Having explained this, I read two scriptures for you quickly. In James chapter 1 verse 4, it says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's teleos. Let patience work her perfect work so that you are complete and entire, wanting nothing. So if you come to any aspect of your work with God and you want nothing anymore, you have become mature. Praise God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28, the Bible said, concerning Jesus whom we preach, it says, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. So the goal of ministration and the goal of gathering together like this is to bring men to a point where they are complete on the day of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wanting nothing, being completely amended until they are fine-tuned to the frequency of God's word. This is why the Holy Ghost teaches. This is why apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are commissioned to build people. In Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11, he said, to some he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, to some he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting. It's the word katatizo, but in, in, in a verb form. He called it katatismos, for the perfecting, for the amending of the saints, for the work of the ministry, until we all come to the unity of the faith, unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Be no more tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That means we have become complete. So somebody can't just show up with a strange doctrine and move us anymore. We are established on the foundation of truth. This is where our Christianity should lead us to. So that when Christ comes, we will look like him. When he comes, we will be identical with him because we would have attained transformation to a degree where we want nothing. Let me explain to you, still buttressing on the area of maturity, seven dimensions of maturity. Because if I leave it open like this, you may not know the area to focus on. So when you find a man who is teleost, when you find a man who is catatismosed, there are seven dimensions that he has attained stature. And those seven dimensions, I will outline them for you quickly. And then as I explain these things, while you take the scriptures down to study further, I encourage you to also compare it with your life. And find out to the degree that you are aligned with these things I'll be sharing. If it is not so, in the last five minutes when I begin to teach you how to grow into maturity, pay attention. I'm highlighting this so that you can measure it with your life. I'm also growing. That's why I thank God for the second definition of maturity. Which is to be mended. Because all of us are being mended. There are few who have been teleost. But most of us are being catatismosed. Are we together? Praise God. So let me show you the seven dimensions and then I also show you how to grow into maturity. Number one, a believer who is mature or perfect knows and walks in the will of God. You want to find somebody who is mature, he knows the will of God and he walks in the will of God. He doesn't do things because they are smart. He doesn't do things because they are reasonable. He doesn't do things because they are fair. All of these factors are good, but they can be manipulated. He does things that are consistent only with the will of God. And the reason is because when you find the will of God, the will of God will be reasonable. 
the will of God will be just. The will of God will be fair. Even when it appears not to be reasonable, give it time. At the end of the tunnel, you will thank your God that you did his will. Because it may look unreasonable at first, but not too long, you will discover that is the best thing you would have done. So a mature believer knows the will of God on every subject to which he deploys his or her life and he conforms his or her life to that will of God that is known. So maturity in this context is the ability to discern the will of God and to align with the will of God. If you, don't, if you cannot discern the will of God and align with the will of God, respectfully, you are either carnal or you are a babe. Carnal in the sense that you are using your brain. A babe in the sense that you are not up to God's standard. And so what you need to do is to quickly repent and find out what God's will is and align with it. In the book of Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 and 42, we saw Jesus trying to access and align with the will of God in the garden of Gethsemane. He had come to a point where he knew that except he be lifted up, what God sent him to the earth for could not be fulfilled. But he had also discerned the pain and the sorrows that he will go through. So while he was in Gethsemane, what he was trying to do was to find the exact will of God and to align with it. And he did. Because the Bible told us that when he was praying, he said, Father, if it is possible, if it were possible, let this cup pass me by. So he had known what God's will is. And it was evident at that point that God's will was not his will. He said, if it were possible, let this cup pass me by. He said, yet not my will, but thine. If you cannot come to that point in your life where everything you find yourself doing, you are able to discern God's will and align with God's will, you may be a prayer warrior. You may be a quota of scriptures. You may be a titled man in church, but you are not mature. The proof that you are mature is that you are able to discern God's will and align with God's will. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, which I quoted a while ago, it said that henceforth we are not children and then who are children he said tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that means we have known exactly what God's will is and we have aligned with God's will like a rock that cannot be moved we stay there no matter what you say we can't be tossed to and fro anymore in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 21 the Bible said to make you perfect in every good work. How? By knowing the will of God. That means if you don't know the will of God, your intentions may be right. Your passion may be correct, but you are not mature. You are mature when you have been able to discern God's will and channel that passion to God's will. If you don't know God's will, unfortunately, you can be tossed. If you don't know God's will, unfortunately, you are a child. And if you are a child, kingdom cannot be committed to you. Ask yourself a question very, very quickly. The job you are doing, is it God's will? Or is it because that's reasonable? Ask yourself. Now, we are not even going into mystical and esoteric realities. Ask yourself, where you are now, is that God's will for your life? Or a door of opportunity just opened and you entered? Now, at certain level of your life, that is acceptable. But a point comes in your life where you cannot just follow opportunities. Because not every door opened is your door. A point comes in your life where you are not just looking for the easy way out. You have come to that level of maturity where you tell yourself, I need to know exactly what God is saying and do only what God is saying. At a level, it's possible. At a level, it's acceptable to apply and to take advantage of every open door. But a level comes where it's not acceptable. For example, I, this man talking to you should have been a naval captain. Maybe somewhere in Meduguri now, walking in the bush with a gun, trying to fight Boko Haram. Is that good? Yes. Because holistically speaking, it procures for national security. But that is not what was written concerning me. What was written concerning me is to preach the word of God to people. And then there are many people who are preaching today where in the chronicles of God, what was written for them is to be in the military. Because God knows that in their day and time, there will be corruption in the military. And he wanted them to be there to stop it. 
but they follow the church and everybody who's praying in tongues for seven hours is a prophet everybody who prays in tongues for 10 hours is an apostle and they were ordained apostles and they left the military uniform and gone and the nation is suffering because they are not in the will of God one of the worst things that happen to people who don't know the will of God is that they are dislocated from destiny this is why I told you that it takes maturity to be rewarded in eternity because if you come to earth and you do what God did not send you to do no matter how well you do it there's no allocation in eternity so you've got to come to that point in your life where you pay the price to find out what God's will is and to first compel yourself by grace and by the Holy Spirit to align with it. There are too many people today who are dislocated. That's why our world is in contradiction. Prophets who have no business on the altar. Military men who have no business in the army. Businessmen who have no business in the marketplace. And so because of dislocation, they are just waiting. Anything goes. And if things are no longer working, they will easily align with compromise. And the point comes, the whole context becomes like a puzzle that is not resolved. You see the head of the lion where the tail should be. You see the leg where the shoulder should be. And you are wondering, what is this? This is why you come to church. You say, what is going on here? Because of dislocation. Men are not mentored and taught to discern and to align with the will of God. You are only made perfect when you discover God's will. So Hebrew 13, 21 said that God will make you perfect in every good work knowing the will of God. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, Paul was praying for the church. And this was Paul's prayers for the church. He wasn't praying for the church to prophesy, primarily speaking. Paul's prayer for the church was twofold. Number one, that they should discern the will of God. And number two, that they should walk in the wisdom of God. And by so doing, become well pleasing to God. Because God will only be pleased with you if you are able to find his will and through his wisdom align with his will. Paul knew this. And this was Paul's emphasis when he mentored and pastored the church. He said, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard of you, talking about their faith in Christ Jesus, he said, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good works. You see the three factors he raised there. Number one, that when you discern the will of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, he said number one, you will now be able to walk worthy of the Lord. You cannot walk worthy of the Lord except as you have discerned God's will. Number two, he said that you will be fruitful. No, that you will be all pleasing. So number one, you become worthy of the Lord. Number two, you become all pleasing. And then number three, you become fruitful in every good work. The reason many people are struggling is because they are doing things that are not captured in their scrolls. Because somebody else is doing it well does not mean you are sent to do it. Make sure you pay the price to discern that that's what God wants you to do. So that your life can be worthy of God your life can be all pleasing and your life can produce fruits that is worthy of results in eternity. In Colossians 4.12, you see Epaphras is one of you, a born servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Many times when we pray for the people that follow us or the people we are privileged to pastor as ministers of God, the major prayer on our lips for them is that they will find God's will and walk in it. We don't primarily pray for people to be rich. We don't primarily pray for people to excel. Primarily, when you find a man who genuinely understands the labor of pastoring, if you find such a man praying, his focus will be what Paul prayed in Colossians 1, 9 and 10, that the people will find God's will and they will discern it, walk in it in wisdom and spiritual understanding. When they do, every other thing will align. It's like a puzzle. It works. And so when you find a mature believer, one of the indices that verifies his level of maturity is that he no longer does things because he pleases men. When you find babes, they want to do what is raining. When you find babes, they want to do what will please people. 
And so you find somebody talking is because he's hoping that if he talks like that, people will be pleased. When I started preaching about the judgment of God and also try to stir revival in the hearts of men, one of the messages God gave me was a judgmental message. People don't appreciate such things because when you are saying it, it looks as if you are condemning them. When you are saying it, it looks as if you are proclaiming yourself to be self-righteous. What do you think you are? You who is talking, is it, are, you, are you saying it because you are perfect? How dare you judge us? People don't like such things. But when God sent me, I knew that I wasn't coming for their applause. I was coming to write and to fulfill God's script. And one thing the Holy Ghost taught me was that you can be crucified. And it's in crucifixion that you fulfill destiny. Because if they clapped for Jesus, he would have failed. Jesus fulfilled destiny on the cross. And so don't be afraid of what men think or say. Some can say you are arrogant. Some can say you are rebellious. Some can say you are whatever they want to say. That's their business. Your marking scheme, as I will always tell you, is not in the congregation. It's in heaven. So when you find mature believers, they've grown from the bondage of people's thoughts and people's approval. They are not doing what they are doing for your approval. If you like it, good for you. If you don't like it, that's your business. They are serving God's will. They know that's what God wants them to do and they keep doing it. But if you have not come to a point of discerning God's will, you will still be running around trying to please people. And that's why nobody can know you for anything. Because today you are talking towards the left. Tomorrow you are talking towards the right. Because you don't have a conviction. You only say what pleases men. This is why King Saul was rejected. God wanted to establish his dominion forever, but he was conscious of what the people would say. Samuel said, wait for me until I come to the high place so that we can offer sacrifice to God. But the people started going. And because he saw that the people were leaving him, he was interested in the crowd. If these people go, what will become of my kingship? It's not the people that establish you as king. You were a nobody looking for donkeys when God called you a king. When did you now become conscious of the people and God showed up? When Samuel showed up, he said, look at what you have done. He said, you have acted foolishly. No wonder he's a child. You have acted foolishly. In fact, when Samuel rebuked him and wanted to go, he held Samuel and his garment tore. Ah! And Samuel turned and said, ah, what have you done? He said, the people, I don't want the elders to think you have rejected me. Ah! Is it the elders that made you king? Is it the people that made you king? He said, look at what you have done. Your kingdom has just been torn from your hands. You've got to know the will of God. Else, people will toss you to and fro. You will not be able to do what God tells you to do because you are seeking one man's approval or you are seeking the approval, you will go nowhere in life. Maturity is the ability to discern the will of God and to align to that will. Number two, maturity is the ability to walk in the wisdom of God. There are many people who are functioning in the wisdom of men. Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians 2 6, he said, How be it we speak wisdom amongst them that are mature? That means those who are mature. They understand the wisdom of God and they live by it. He said, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that comes to north. That means there are other wisdoms. There is the wisdom of this world. There is also the wisdom of the princes of this world. But Paul said, according to the judgment system of God, they have already been vetoed to amount to nothing. He said, but the wisdom we speak amongst the mature, he said, is the hidden mysteries of God that was programmed for our glory. And so when you find a mature believer, he is not in alignment with the world. The world will always have their view. The world will always have their opinions. The world will always have their position. But the church is never pitched with the world. Our position is always opposite to the world system because we are regulated by different wisdom. 
in James chapter 3 verse 17, it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. This is not the world's wisdom. This is a kingdom God-ordained kind of wisdom. There are few men functioning here because they are not yet mature. I give you a few instances. For example, when you talk about prosperity, I come back to it again. I'm not going to take seats. <laughs> I'm not preaching so that um, I end up and say, give one million. That's not what I mean. When we talk about prosperity, for example, this is what the world thinks. The world said, get all you can and can all you get. Get all you can and what? Can all you get. That means it's a selfish and self-centered system of operation. If you can kill yourself to get anything that will prosper you, anything you should do to get it, get it. As far as they are concerned, there is no moral standard. There is no value system. If you are vicious in getting it, be vicious. If you are subtle in getting it, be subtle. If you are violent in getting it, be violent. And after you have gotten it, because you are the one who labored for it, keep it for yourself alone and enjoy. Heaven helps those who help themselves. That's the wisdom of the world. But when you come to the, this side of the kingdom, he said, the liberal soul shall be made fat. It says, him that watereth shall himself be watered unto. It says, give a portion to seven. Give a portion to eight. You know not the evil that comes upon the earth. It says, him that lendeth to the poor. It says, lendeth unto the Lord. It said, cry out. Say to my people, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. It said, give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together and running over, shall God cause men to give to your bosom. They are different operational modalities. The word says to keep. The kingdom says to give. How can you prosper by scattering? It's a wisdom that is from above. And then you find many believers today, they live by the wisdom of the world. And they think they are mature Christians because they sing good songs and they prophesy. For you to be mature, you must live your life based on the dictates of the world system. The world system thinks self. Kingdom talks sacrifice. While they are advocating for self-centeredness, kingdom is advocating for selflessness. And so there is no point where they can converge because the philosophy is different. You are a mature believer, you must begin to subscribe to God's wisdom. Take for example, when you talk about the subject of love, how does the world show love? The love of the world system is a bargain. I can't give you anything that doesn't profit me. And so when you give money to a young lady, you are not being kind. You want to date her. That's the normal wisdom of the world. And even the ladies know, if you start being kind to them, they say, what do you want? What do you want? Wait, wait, let's understand. Where are you going to? Because they know that as far as the world is concerned, nothing goes for nothing but in the kingdom everything goes for nothing there's no way to harmonize it so that i do good to you does not mean i have any intention whatsoever i might just have been motivated with compassion i might just have been moved by kindness and so i can empty all i have for you and we will never meet again i'm not giving you to get anything in return that's the kingdom philosophy and then you are wondering how can you gain how can you do this and gain? Are you not being foolish? The reason you can do this is because God will not reward you back primarily in what you gave. You can give somebody money and God can deliver you from an accident. That's why we don't quantify our return based on what we gave. You can give somebody something and God rewards you with favor. And you can give something and God does not reward you at all. On earth, he will start rewarding you from eternity. And then you are wondering, how come? Did you not read the scriptures? In fact, I tell you a story. A man came to me and he was lamenting. What was the source of his lamentation? Ten years ago, a prophet came and said, if they give to God, God will bless them. 
And so he gave one million. And since he gave that one million, his finances and his resources had not gone up. He was expecting because the prophet was doing mathematics for them. 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold. And God never said the 30 fold must be in Naira. He didn't say the 100 fold. And so when the guy met me, he was so bitter that all these fake things they are doing in church. I said, well, I don't know the prophet that preached to you. <laughs> I don't know the message you heard. But as far as the kingdom is concerned, one of God's ways of enriching his people is by inviting them to give generously. Because when they do so, they provoke a return. And that return can be of any source. But in case you went to God to do trade by butter, I'm sorry, to the crooked, he will show himself crooked. To the cunning, he will show himself cunning. So you just received. And the man repented. And he began to give because of love for the kingdom. And suddenly, things began to shift. That means God was watching his heart. Because the doctrine they taught him then was going to make him more selfish. It's called the wisdom of the world. When you find mature believers, you will think they are foolish. That's why you find somebody walking in the house of God and nobody remembers to say thank you and is excited. And then you are wondering, come on, ah, my brother, take it easy. What is wrong with you? You don't know what he knows. You think you are smarter because you are walking by another principle. When the true light appears, you will know who is wise. You to understand this because if you are not careful to understand the world system, you will begin to live your life by the standards of the world system. And you will think you are making progress. And the, the, the deception in this thing is that you will start judging your progress by the results. And because you, you have two cars in one month, you say God is promoting you. You have been shifted. Your progress in the kingdom is not based on results. Your progress in the kingdom is based on the virtues of God that you have grown in. Results are byproducts. You and I can do the same thing. God can choose to give you a car and God can choose to teach me patience. If you think the car is a sign that you've gone ahead, you are joking. Because we receive two different things based on the direction we are going to. A prophet can pray and God can choose to give him more sight. An evangelist can pray God can choose to give him visibility. A giver, a son of consolation can pray and God can give him money. If the son of consolation thinks growing in God is how much you have, he has missed it. In fact, an intercessor can pray and God will hide him the more. It is according to the direction of their destiny. An evangelist needs visibility to attract more people. An intercessor needs to be hidden to pray more. A giver needs more money to sponsor the kingdom. There is a place where God can buffer the boat for all of us to be contempt or contempted with such as we have. But your horn will grow in the direction of your ordination. And so if you see somebody becoming popular and he doesn't understand the wisdom of God, he will assume that because they are calling him from 20 nations now, he is the senior apostle. The other one is started with who nobody knows him outside that state will start carrying his Bible. And when they go for a meeting, sometimes they will say, come and lay hands on him. He wants, him to, he wants to promote him. <laughs> because he thinks promotion is visibility. He doesn't know that visibility is a byproduct. And then the one that has become rich now, when he comes to church, he won't smile anymore. In fact, the place he used to sit, he won't like that seat anymore. If he comes to church, there's a way he will walk. When you put him in front, then he will say, that is not humility, it's fake. The day he goes to the back, he will become angry and leave the church. Because we think, I, I'm helping these people. Can you imagine? I'm helping them. The last program they did, I alone gave 5 million. Can you imagine? <laughs> you don't know the wisdom of God. 
If you think we'll honor you because you gave five million, you are a joker. Because that five, that five million you gave is equivalent to the 30 hours of prayer that the other intercessor prayed. Your, own five, your five million is seen. It, it will take the angels that stop prayers in golden vials to tell us who has more stature. Because the prayers of the saints, the Bible said, it ascend to heaven as others. <laughs> Kai. Let's stop here so that we go forward. So you want to be a mature believer, you must know the wisdom of God. That's why the one who is praying should do it with cheerfulness and humility. The one who is giving should do it cheerfully and with humility. The one who God has announced, who is all over the billboards and posters and flyers and in every nation, should do it with humility and cheerfulness. No one is greater than the other. In fact, the prescription of scripture is that to esteem others more highly than yourself. That's wisdom. And when you find people who are like that, they are truly mature. The guy can be the CEO of a bank. All his tithes are in seven digits. But when he comes to church, he's an usher. And then you, you meet him at the door. Hey, give me one envelope there. I said, tight envelope. Why are you giving me offering envelope? Didn't you hear what I said? When you meet him on Monday, you will not. <laughs> but he's mature. And so he sees everything as service. And when you embarrass him like that, he will not be moved to say, what? Do you know me? Is it because I'm standing here? <laughs> no. It's the way of the world. In the world system, if you don't introduce people where you are in trouble, they will come and say, ah, are you not aware that I've completed my PhD? Why didn't you add doctor? Ah, I'm no longer Mr. I'm now doctor. <laughs> because he knows that when you call him doctor, it will add more and he, he will start walking like a humble man. <laughs> Those who have eyes in the spirit, they know that that is pride in this guy. If you want to check whether he's humble, don't call doctor. He will kill you. You know, I used to be an MC. <laughs> I know it by experience. I came for a meeting. I needed to introduce. There were over 40 pastors. How can I call everybody? So I was trying to call the, you know, when you are doing this thing, sometimes even your neighbor, you forget his name. If you, do, if you know what I'm saying, you know it. And so I was calling the names of people and introducing them and somehow I omitted one of the brothers who is a minister. After the meeting, the next thing I heard, I started hearing rumor. I was told that Mike doesn't like me. Somebody told me he said something about me. I took it for granted, but he proved it today. And he couldn't hold it. This is not parable. I'm telling you real things that happen. And the brother, the man of God came to me and said, so you introduce everybody. I'm the, I'm the one that is not worthy of introduction. Thank you. Thank you. I apologized for where no, 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 no problem. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, come on, it's nothing. No, no, it's a lie. The next time I greeted him, yeah. Ah, for introduction. It's the way of the world. If you know this kingdom, sometimes to introducing you is a body. You are hoping they shouldn't even know you are around. You want to sneak in and sneak out. But when you operate by the philosophy of the world, you will resemble your ancestors in the flesh. You will resemble the country you came from. When you start operating by divine wisdom, you become an alien. Jesus said the world, if the world hates you, is because they hated me first. The reason is because our philosophy is different. It's different. That's how you find a mature believer. He doesn't look like the world. Another wisdom powers him. Number three, you want to find a mature believer? It's one that walks in love. When I finish outlining these seven dimensions of maturity, you will find that we will never talk anything about gifts. And this will help you not to be under pressure anymore. 
You can mentor somebody who is a seer. You can mentor somebody who raises men from the dead. You need to understand that stature is not a function of the manifestation. And so when you want to teach him the ways of God, put all of those manifestations aside and face his character. And if he thinks that because of the manifestation he has, he is big, leave him. When he grows up, he will discover that it's not a function of gift. A lot of people are intimidated by gifts and gifted men. When we are talking about development, spiritual development and maturity, gift is not in the syllabus. And so when you find people who are gifted, don't be intimidated. Don't feel insecure. Celebrate what God is doing with them. Encourage them to do it more. But come back to the blueprint and teach them how to grow. Don't because somebody is prophesying or somebody is opening blind eyes. You now say, don't let that brother lead prayer again. The last time he led prayers, blind eyes opened. So after service, two people went and gave seed. When you sat down, you were watching. You were counseling and watching. And you saw that the only seed they gave that day they gave to the man that manifested. You didn't say anything. You now got offended that they gave him seed. He didn't show you. And because of that, what he's doing is for money. And then you start killing and rebuking him. You want to kill that gift by all means. It's not necessary. He can raise the dead. It will advance the church. Teach him the ways of God and encourage him to grow in his gift. He needs to know that his gift does not give him maturity. Maturity is character oriented. So stop the insecurity, stop the witchcraft, stop the manipulation. It's not necessary. Those working under you can be a thousand times more gifted than you. It will help you grow the church. Some of the mighty men of David were stronger than David. When David was to be killed in battle, he's one of those men that came to save him. If you kill that gift, that gift may be the reason why the seven billionaires that will be in the church will come. So you now kill the gift and they don't come. Your ministry will end up in one local government. There will be nobody to pay for TV. And you will use your witchcraft to kill and short circuit your ministry. <laughs> because they told you that Brother B went for that VG and a dead person came back to life. Brother B, B now, you will remove him from prayer department and put him on sanctuary keepers. Or you put him on security man. Let him be outside. They shouldn't even see him in the hall again. <laughs> it's not necessary. Praise God. Encourage gifts. But also build people along the lines of character. The third sign of a mature believer is the ability to walk in love. In 1 Corinthians 13 from verse 1 to 5, there are so many scriptures about love. So many. You can't even exhaust them. I will just give them to you so you go check them out. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He said the fruit of the spirit is love. And then he began to explain the different dimensions of love. There are four things I want to pick out quickly around love to help us understand it. As you read the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 13, in fact from verse 1 to 13, Galatians 5, 22, 23, you will find it there. But let me pick three things about love that is very important for us to pay attention to. Number one is selflessness. When you find a believer who is mature, one of the first traits you will discover in that person is selflessness. It will be easy and natural for him to consider others before himself. In fact, you will become concerned and you will be tempted to advise him to also think about himself. He will be selfless to a fault. It's a sign of maturity. The reason is because love has overwhelmed him. So he can't think of having when others don't have. And because of that, everything he does will be motivated by love. And the way you see it is through selflessness. It's not the type we practice today. I need you to know the difference. It's not this one you give somebody 100,000. And because you gave him 100,000, you expect that he should become your ally forever. 
The day he does what God tells him to do, or the day he does something that is not in alignment with what you are doing, you now say, Ingrid. Ingrid. That's witchcraft. If I'm helping you, it's unconditional. If it is not unconditional, it's not love. And it's not selfless. There's no decision you will take in your life that should be because I gave you something. If I want you to take decisions because of what I gave you, it's called witchcraft. You should have the liberty to take decisions based on what you believe God wants you to do. And I should have the love of God in my heart enough to respect that decision. The moment I feel because I fed you, or because I gave you clothes, or because I gave you money, or because I gave you something, you are, your life should be enslaved to me. I've become a witch. And at best, at best, I'm a wicked man. Worst case scenario, I want to destroy your destiny. What the world does, hope you know what happened in the last, uh, last week. Because somebody contested, the other person says he's an ingrid. Meanwhile, the nation depends on credible people. You literally, the nation should be delivered from you, but you. <laughs> Since you are laughing, you know you know this parable, so I won't say it again. <laughs> When you do things for people, don't enslave them in the process. It's called witchcraft. When you do things for people, release them. Because the reason you are doing it is because you want their lives to improve. Not because you are trying to rope them. In psychology, it's called operant conditioning. It's manipulation. True love is selfless. The same way a father loves the son. That's how love in the context of selflessness should be done. I can't train my child and expect that because of that, my child should not have a life anymore. No. That's not how it works. If we are not selfless, then we don't know love. Everything we are doing is an investment. It's not because we love the person. When we gave money, when we gave housing, when we gave shelter, when we gave food, it was not love. It was investment. We were trying to rope the people to become our slave. If it is love, it must be selfless. It must be unconditional. I shouldn't expect you to do anything for me because of what I did for you. If you choose to do it because God has opened your eyes to be grateful, glory to God. God will reward you for it. But for me to insist that you must live in a certain way because I've done something for you is witchcraft. But unfortunately, our world is trained to think that way. They don't care about you anymore. They don't care about the... And this thing I'm saying happens both top to the top and then from top to down. All of those manipulations, we must destroy them if we want to truly walk in love. Love is selfless. Number two, love operates in humility. A kind of humility that secures the integrity of the one loved. See what happens in our generation. You need to pay school fees. I want to give you school fees and then I will ridicule you publicly. I will bring you to the altar. Show how helpless you are without my intervention. Show how useless your life would have been if God didn't help you to bring me into your life. And when I'm done, I will give you 30,000 naira. That's criminal. It's not the love of God. I rob you, destroy your reputation, destroy your integrity, destroy your humanity because I want to momentarily give you assistance. That is a demonic order of operation. It's not of God. If it is love, it will be done in humility and cheerfulness. I don't need the whole world to know that you are the only person here who can pay school fees before I give you school fees. I don't need the whole world to know that you have to go undergo operation and I have to, no, no, that's not the kingdom way. Now, there's a place where you go out for charity. And because you have partners for accountability sake, you have to, you give out and a few documentaries are kept. At least let the partners know what their money is used for. 
But to ridicule people and bring the person out and say this person could not eat food in the last two weeks, they don't have what to eat, so we are helping the person, or this person is going for an operation, he will die if we don't help. That's not of God. You finish helping that person and you destroy every humanity and essence that God has put in him. You have not helped the person. All his life, he will walk in the shadow of himself. That's not how the kingdom works. When I help you in humility, my help will give you dignity. When I help you in humility, my help will procure for you a confidence and an assurance that your tomorrow holds something. I shouldn't provide help for you and that help destroys your confidence, destroys your assurance for tomorrow. That is not of God. It is witchcraft. You want to walk in love? You must be cheerfully humble. Don't destroy people because you are helping them. It's not of God. The third thing I want to outline under love is forbearance. You know, the Holy Ghost started talking to me recently because I discovered I was very guilty on this one. I hate incompetence. Ah! If you should do something in a certain way and you can't do it, and then I explain it, and I explain it again, and you can't do it. I can't tolerate it. Ah, the anger. What is this? And the Holy Ghost began to ask me recently, say, is it because I've helped you? Is it because I've helped you? Does it occur to you that these people doing this thing, they are trying their whole best, not just to do it right, but to please you? What if you were the one in their shoes? Is this how you will react? <laughs> Even after he said it, it takes time. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because when you do something after a while, your mind is programmed that way. Adrenalines are secreted. I was telling my wife two days ago, I said, I'm praying now for God to help me. But if you truly walk in love, you will forbear. The Bible says forbearing with one another and therefore fulfilling the law of Christ. The reason is because if you don't do this, people who come around you, instead of becoming a better version of themselves, they will end up becoming fearful and they will become mediocre. Because they will not know what to do that will be either right or wrong. They will not know how to do anything that will make you happy. So all their lives they become too careful. And because they become too careful, they will never get it right again. And so when a man truly begins to walk in love, one thing he must allow to flow in his life is forbearance. Allow people to make the mistakes. Correct them in love. And as you correct them in love, hope that they will grow and become better. Don't let your attempt to get people to do it right break and destroy them. Because if you are not careful, you will make them a worse version of themselves. The reason many families break up is because of the absence of forbearance. Somebody uses the toothpaste and he doesn't close it well or he leaves some of the paste on the cover and the next one comes and says, where did you grow up? Don't they use toothpaste in your village? Even if a goat used toothpaste, will it be like this? You have not done marriage counseling. You will hear things. Even if a goat uses toothpaste, will it be like this? Then the other, what? Are you calling me a goat? I didn't call you a goat. But what? how do you explain this? Ah! And before you know, goo, 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 marriage has scattered. You'll find out what happened. He said toothpaste. You will now say, ah, are you having problem because of toothpaste? <laughs> it's not toothpaste. It's absence of forbearance. There's no forbearance. You come to the room, ties in the parlor, suit is on the dining, <laughs> shoe is in front of the door. <laughs> and then the wife is coming in. Why would this man drop his tie here? Is this where he took it from? As she carries the tie, she's trying to calm herself down. She will now see suit falling. What kind of thing is this? And then she's entering the room to go and quarry. The shoe at the door now causes her to stumble. <laughs> the moment she enters the room, are you okay? Where will you change? I'm tired. <laughs> listen. Listen. 
If you study Galatians 5.22, you will notice something. He said the fruit of the Spirit is. He's not telling you that it's not there. It's already in your spirit. It's your duty to cultivate it. You already have patience. You already have kindness. You already have forbearance. But it's your responsibility to cultivate it. That's why he called it the fruit of the Spirit. The moment you receive Christ, those things were planted in your spirit. And so one thing you do to help yourself is to tell yourself, I refuse to be bitter. I choose to walk in love. I choose to forbear. If you begin to reprogram and re-educate your spirit, after a while you will discover that these things will begin to flow. Because if there is no forbearance, there can be no love. People are not living happily together because there are no issues that should raise offense. But they have learned how to forbear. And because they've learned how to forbear, they know how to carry the yokes of one another until they collectively walk into perfection. The Bible said in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, it said that thou mightest cleanse her by washing with water by the word of God. That means God expects that you should perfect your wife. And the same thing applies to the woman to perfect you. But before you are able to perfect your wife or your wife perfects you, the garbage she came with or the garbage you came with, you will first of all carry it for a season. It's as you are carrying it that you'll be removing it one at a time. And the way to carry it is through forbearance. If there's no forbearance, there can be no love. That's what I tell people. It's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. Even goats have feeling. These are the true dimensions of love. Our generation is too intolerant. And when I say intolerant, I'm not talking about the one gay people do. <laughs> it's not the gay tolerance that I'm defining here. Because that one is against the will of God. All we are saying here is within the context of the will of God. Before a gay person hears me and say, this is the true man of God. We said it, that intolerant. Christians are intolerant. That's not what I'm saying. I am intolerant towards gay. It's an abomination. Hallelujah. Are you learning something? The fourth way to show love is through kindness. And you need to understand that this thing is not just about the people you are dealing with. It's also about you. The quality of your life is the degree to which you resemble God. It's not about people. See, when you forgive people, it's not about them. It's about you. That means forgiveness is a quality of your spirit. When you are kind towards people, it's not about them. It means kindness is a quality of your spirit. When you are merciful, it means mercy is a quality of your spirit. That's why even those who don't deserve forgiveness, you forgive them. Because your refusal to forgive them will corrupt your nature. You want to keep God's nature. So you won't let any unreasonable person corrupt your nature. So whether they deserve it or not, you will forgive them all the same. Because it's your nature you are about to preserve. I won't become a dog because you offended me. You get the point. You've got to keep the quality of your spirit. And so the fourth way to show love is through kindness. Kindness is to speak fondly to people. To speak to people in a way that they are encouraged and not destroyed. That's what kindness is about. To relate with people in a way that brings the best out of them. There are certain people that even though they wish well for people, the way they communicate it is too harsh and corrosive. And so, they destroy the people in an attempt to help them. The Bible said, let your words be seasoned with grace. That means when you talk to people, you shouldn't destroy them. When you talk to people, they should be encouraged to want to do more. When you talk to people, they should be energized. When you talk to people, they should be excited. Not to be downtrodden. Your words should build. Your lifestyle should encourage. It's a sign that the love of God is in your spirit and that you are spiritually mature. Number five is faithfulness. A man who is, faith, is mature is dependable. And I use faithfulness in this context because many people don't understand faithfulness. There are two things you need to understand about faithfulness. Faithfulness is a revelation of the strength of character. When you say you will get something done, it's not because the person is grateful. It's not because the person is happy. It's not, the person, it's not because the person paid well enough. It's because your spirit is excellent. And everything you begin to do, 
you don't just finish it, but you finish it in such a way that no other person in the world would have done it better. It's a quality of your spirit. And then the second thing about faithfulness is that your promotion is tied to your faithfulness. He said, if you are not faithful in little, you are not faithful in much. He didn't say you will not be. You are not. He said, if you are not faithful in another man's business, who will give you yours? So when we deal with the subject of faithfulness, it's beyond obeying someone. It's beyond getting a job done. It's a state of excellence that a man is dependable. And many times, when you find dependable people, it's not primarily because they are competent. It's actually because they are full of love. So they are doing a job, you didn't pay them well. But they cannot afford to leave and that thing fails. There is something in them that compels them to get it done the right way. When they are working with you, sometimes you do things that hurt them. But they cannot afford to let things spoil in their hands. And so even though you are not worth that result they are creating, the love in them will not let them do anything less than they should do. So love compels faithfulness. The reason our generation can't find faithful men is because love is dying. There is bitterness in the heart of many people. There is insecurity in the heart of many people. There is pride in the heart of many people. When you find men who are full of love, it will be natural for them to be faithful. Praise God. So these are five character traits of love that defines love as a basis for spiritual maturity. Number four, sign of spiritual maturity or dimension is control over your tongue. The Bible used the tongue here synonymously with the flesh. It's the ability to tame the flesh. In James chapter 3 verse 2, this is what the Bible says. If any man offend not in words, he is mature or perfect and able to subject the body. So it's not just about talking now, it's about the flesh generally. Anybody who can rule over his words and his tongues, he said that person is perfect and he has won the battle of the body or the flesh. In Proverbs 16 verse 32, he said, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit is better than him that taketh a city. Our generation is only interested in abilities. But the Bible is revealing to us that the first dimension of ability is the one exercised inward. The ability exercised inward precedes the ability exercised outward. If you cannot rule over yourself, even if you take a city, you are weak. That's what scriptures is teaching us tonight. And so a believer who is mature is conscious about what he says and about how he does what he does. He doesn't just jump and does everything. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, the Bible said, Him that striveth for the mastery. Him that striveth for the mastery. He said he's temperate in all things. This is why many times when you see believers who have served the Lord for years, one thing you notice about them is that they are conserved. It looks as if they are naturally conservative people. No, it's not so. God has taught them a lot of things. They've suffered in the flesh. So they've known how to rule over the flesh. Him that striveth for the mastery. If you just do what you feel like doing, you are still ruled by your flesh and your senses. You are not mature. The sign that you are mature is that you can control your emotions. The signs that you are mature is that you can control what you say. The sign that you are mature is that you can rule over your mind. You can decide what to think. You can decide the emotions you sustain per time. And you can decide how you act. It's not to apologize all the time. And then you come and say, the Bible said, forgive your brother 70 times, 7 times in a day. That means I have the license to offend 490 times. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> People use scriptures for everything. Every day you meet them, they are apologizing for something. They are babes. And when you don't forgive them, they say, but I said sorry. Why are people so un 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 unfair? Why are people so unforgiving in this generation? So you have the license to offend everybody. You match this one, you kick this one, and you say they should forgive you. Yeah, are you not of God? Were you not forgiving your own sins? Why can't you forgive others? 
we will kick you out of the assembly of the brethren. <laughs> Praise God. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I've quoted it again and again for you. Paul said, for this cause, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. That's maturity. I dictate for my emotions. My emotions don't dictate for me. I can be angry, but I can keep my peace. I can be bitter, but I can purge it out of my soul and still show you love. Many times, when people do things, you ask them, they said, leave me alone. That's how I feel. You are not commanded to live based on your feeling. He said, we walk by faith, not by sensory perception. When you are still living based on your feeling, you are a child. This is why many people, they prophesy. They cast out demons, but they are still babes. Offend them. They must give it to you back in the same measure. Else they will not rest. Ah! If he, they will crush you before they know that it... Ah, no, no, no. Even you know that you can't try them. They will crush you. And they are so proud about it. Me, you don't try me. You, no, no, no. no. I'll go kill you. I'll go kill you. There's a, a prophet now that says he will kill you. Even in church, when he talks, he says, shut up. <laughs> it's how he feels that he operates. That's a babe. It's an elder with a pampas. <laughs> a believer who is mature rules over his emotion. He's angry. It's not pretense. He can purge that anger from his soul and still show you love. You can disappoint him. He will still draw you and encourage you. If he needs to rebuke you, he will rebuke you and then build you up. He doesn't flow by his emotions. He controls them. But for you to get there, you must suffer in the flesh. You know, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible said, As Christ suffered in the flesh, we also should have that as an example. It says, Him that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sinning. It, that's how God teaches men how to be temperate. Somebody accuses you. You have all the evidences. You want to shout. You say, keep quiet. Mm. The energy you would have used to defend yourself will now explode on your inside. And then where you are standing, you will just see tears. Huh? If only you will say two things, you will not just vindicate yourself, but you will ventilate yourself. But the Holy Ghost say, mm. because of the weight of power that you would have used to produce self-defense, it will explode inside. And then, that's what Peter called to suffer in the flesh. You follow the dictates of the Holy Spirit until your, your senses are mortified. Many mature people, they will tell you how many times they've walked on this corridor. When they should speak and people will die, they... Mm. So sometimes you find some elders, when you talk, they just do like this. That was the only ventilation they learned when the Holy Ghost was restraining them. Some, when you talk, they say... Mm. Mm. It doesn't come with old age. It comes with suffering in the flesh. When God says, keep quiet. Mm. Mm. You will become so used to... Mm. People will now, young believers will now see you and they will stand and say, mm. <laughs> they don't know, they don't know the depth. That's why you can come somewhere and when you say, mm, demons will go. Because that part has become a conduit pipe in the spirit. Because the Holy Ghost used that part to route his way into your spirit. Many times when you wanted to function in the flesh, that was the gateway that he found. And so now that he has secured you, that gateway becomes a channel for the flow of the anointing. So when you come for a miracle meeting, you can stand and say, mm. Mm. when you say, mm, somebody will shout, I can see. Somebody will jump out of the wheelchair. Mm. I went for a meeting. I, I, I studied patterns. There's a man, he's over. Is he 79 years old? Pastor Victor, were you in that meeting? That Papa Mashika. He came for a meeting and, well, I don't know if I preached that day. Somebody preached with fire. Everybody was shaking. When they now gave him the mic, he now said, the three things that stop revival, number one, is sin. Number two, is lack of love. Number three, is lack of the fear of God. If these three things come, revival will come. We should stop all those big things we are preaching. <laughs> when he finished, he now said, okay, now he wants to pray. He carried the mic and he said, the moment he said, mm, 
I heard people started shouting. What is happening here? <laughs> if you try your own, mm, that mm, they will come and collect Mike and say, God bless you. <laughs> because you will kill every atmosphere. They have suffered in the flesh. There are many times God sent them and said, go to this city. I will tell you what to do. They went without money. And when they came to the city, they are walking around waiting for God to say something. Sometimes they will sit on the covert, hungry, not knowing where to sleep. <sighs> that home is a body. It's a story of the journey that they have with Abba. The path that they have traveled with Elohim. The gutters, the depths, the dark alleys that God led them to. Because he needed to teach them that to walk with the Holy Ghost, you must be blind. Your eyes will become your weakness. They learned those things in the school of the spirit. And so when they come out, when you hear those hymns, they mean many things. It's called to suffer in the flesh. If you don't go through this school, you can't dominate the flesh. Your tongue will still rule you. That's why your life is, more, is full of apologies. You now say, God has helped me. Now I can apologize. You know, some people feel that because they apologize, they must be forgiven. Because for them, to apologize is a big deal. Because for the first 15 years of their life, they don't know how to say sorry. Now that they are saying sorry, if you don't forgive them, they will get angry. You mean I apologize? You can't forgive? What do you mean? Uh -uh. You are not entitled to forgive them because you apologize. It's the man you offend that decides to forgive you. <laughs> to walk in law, you must be a faithful man. We may have to stop here because of time. There are, there are three more I would have shared. But we'll stop here. So that I can give you two ways of beginning to cultivate these things. How to grow in maturity. Because I have three more minutes. Meanwhile, let me add one before I tell you how to grow in maturity. <laughs> the fifth way to walk in maturity is to walk by faith. I needed to add this before I go so that I cap it up. To walk by faith. Four times in scriptures. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. Romans 1 17. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. And Hebrews 13 verse 8. The Bible said we walk by faith. It said the just shall live by faith. That means if you have come to the full essence of your justification, the way it shows is that you begin to live by faith. And what it means is that you are no longer ruled by facts. You are now ruled by the unseen realities of God, the word of God. The fact can say something that is at variance with what God says. You are able to choose what God says over and above what the fact is saying. When you have come there, you have become a mature believer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, according as it is written, he said, they believe and have spoken. We, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. And how did he explain what that means? In verse 17, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, he said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's the fact realm. He said, he worketh for us an exceeding weight of glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things that are unseen. He said, for the things that are seen, they are temporal. But the things that are unseen, they are eternal. When you see a mature believer, he has developed his discernment to function at the frequency of the speakings of God. And so when facts, do, do no, when facts refuse to align, with what God says. He is able to pick what God is saying and stay there. He would rather be endangered standing with God than to be saved standing apart from God. He has learned that much. This is the way of the mature. This is what God taught Abraham. In Romans 4, 17, the Bible said, who against hope believed in hope that he will be the father of many nations according as it was said unto me, Thou shalt be the father of many nations. In verse 18, he said, Abraham believed 
against hope. That means what the facts were saying were wrong. They were opposite what God was saying. But the man was learning how to live by God's word and not by what facts told him. And he said he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. He said he was strong in faith, giving thanks to God. Do you know why people are depressed most of the times? It's because they are slaves of fact. They read their lives from the plane of facts. The fact says they are finished. The fact says they will die. And so they go and lie down. They cry and weep. Wake up. Every time a mature believer shows up, every variant fact is an opportunity to manifest the glory of God. This was what Jesus taught them at the tomb of Lazarus. If you were here, my brother would not have died. He said, have I not told you? If thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. I told you on Sunday, challenges are not meant to destroy you. They are opportunities for you to manifest God. If thou wouldest believe, why not see what God says? Why not look away? He said, Who, whose report shall you believe? He said, unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This is the realm of those that have come to maturity in the spirit. If the facts align, thank God for them. But if the facts disalign, they would rather choose to stand with God than to choose with facts. This is not a mental accent. It's a reality in the spirit. If you study Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of seeing things not seen. He said, by it, the elders, not the babes, by it, he said, the elders obtain the good report. So the elders are the ones who are able to live by faith, not by sensory perception. They know what the fact is saying. They accept the fact to the degree that he aligns with God's word. The day the facts disalign, they leave the facts alone. Did you not read in the Bible? It says, if you are sick, James 5.14, Whoever is sick, he said, take him to the elders. You know what it means? The elders don't fall sick. Because even when they are sick, he said, let no man in Zion say I'm sick. Whatever it is they need to do to excavate health out of their spirit, they will do it. They have walked this path for too long. The way of faith is the way of spiritual maturity. Too many people live by their senses. And the reason they live by their senses is because they've not built their discernment. And so when we talk about living by faith, we're actually talking about living by discernment. You have built your faculties so high in the spirit that you are no longer controlled by what you see, what you perceive, and what you hear. You are controlled by what God says. And if God does not move, you will stand. The Bible said Abraham moved with his sons, Isaac and Jacob, seeking a city with foundation whose builder is God. That is an elder. That is an elder. That's what it takes to be mature. You don't just read the word. At this level, you act the word. When you find a man who lives by faith, he's an actor of the word of God. The word of God for him becomes an adventure. The things God says, they may not make sense, but he will step on the water. Like Peter. If it be thou, bid me come. He said, come. And the guy began to walk. They know how to act the word out. That's why it says strong meat belongs to them who are of full age. Who by reason of use. So you come of full age when you begin to use the word of God. You are not a man of faith by, by hearing, reading and quoting the word. You are actually a man of faith when you begin to act the word. Oh my God. I wish I had time to tell you stories of actors. Do you not know why it's called the acts of the apostles? They were actors of the word. There were many times they were kept behind prisons. But while they were there, he said, when it was midnight, 
Oh my God. I heard that prayer has powers. I want to act it. They flogged the man and threw him in prison. They never read that they lamented. They were waiting for the hour of warfare. Because they know in the spirit there's a time where princes fight. Did you not read what Jesus said? He said, I was with you in the temple. You never arrested me. He said, but this is your hour. And so when they locked them up, they knew something about prayer. But for them, prayer is not a doctrine. He said, when it was midnight, he said, Paul and Silas, they prayed. <laughs> they sang. They sang. He said, the angel came down. When the angel stood in the prison, the first thing that shook was the foundation. That means when men begin to pray, they are not talking to lintels. They are going down to uproot the things that alter the paradigm. The doors opened on their own accord. The jailer showed up. The man that flogged them and put them in prison. He wanted to kill himself. He said, don't worry, sir. We are here. You were not the one that imprisoned us. We came into the prison because this will be an immortal testimony. Generations to come, they will read it that once upon a time, Paul and Barnabas had started their lives for the gospel. We want to write a testimony for them generations to come. Who told you you could imprison us? I don't know about you. I want to be an elder. Oh, I don't just want to be an apostle. See, I want to be an elder. Peter was writing. And they said concerning him, he said, me also, I'm an elder. That means I have handled the word of God. That's what John was talking about. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. We have handled the word. Oh. We don't have time. I would have, I would have soared in the spirit. But we don't have time. You will know what this man knew. That a king, a king will give a decree that let no man pray to another God. And Daniel will say, no, I'm not here to please you. I'm a, I'm a, my allegiance is to another flag. My allegiance is to another nation. My allegiance is to another king. And he didn't hide to pray. The Bible said he opened his window and he knelt down and prayed three times in a day. When they arrested him, there was no record that he begged. Because when you find men that walk by faith, everything becomes a platform for manifestation. When they cast him to the lion's den, he didn't say anything. He allowed them to come after the whole night. And the king showed up and said, Oh, Daniel. He said, Did your God deliver you from the den of the lion? And Daniel, Oh my God. This man became like immortals. He said, Oh, king, live forever. The God that I serve, he has not allowed the lions to devour me. He shut their mouth. When they held Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said, cause the fire to be intensified seven times. They never begged. When they threw them into the fire, they were singing and praising God. It was the king that noticed. He said, who is the fourth man in the fire? He said, this one looks like the son of the highest. When you walk by faith, you become a memorial. Because the things that will come out of your life, it will be a testimony for generations after you. That's why you talk about Benz in Idahosa. Some of you have never heard these messages, but you know the mountains that it defied. Time, time is a body. Please sit down, sit down. Sit down. We don't have time to journey. I was doing doctrine. I want to journey now. But there's no time. Ha! <laughs> oh God! Oh God! I, I started sensing an oil. See, we teach certain things because we were taught doctrine. But there are other things we teach because scrolls are open. When those scrolls open, you don't just talk. You can sense the oil. It flows into your tongue and the walls become sweet. It's like you are chewing an ancient secret my God 
Don't worry. One day we will have fellowship beyond the stars. <laughs> Maturity. We will complete the lesson when next God permits. Bow your heads and ask God to help you to grow. next I teach, I will show you how to grow, how to build these things. Ask the Lord to help you. Ask him to help you. He said, ask, you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be open. Ask him to help you. You don't want to be dwarfed forever in eternity. You don't want to be a child forever. You want to journey with God and grow in your Christian experience. you need to forgive people. You need to let go of people from your heart. He said lay aside every yoke and every weight. Every sin and every weight that doth easily beset you and run the race with patience. You have carried somebody in your heart. It's not necessary. Take off those weights and move forward. says to run the race with patience if it's maturity if it's maturity of necessity there must be patience the grace to wait the grace the grace to stay when God is walking on you the grace to stay I pray for you today you know when the mother hand sits on the egg if it doesn't sit to completion, that egg can no longer be an egg. And that egg will never be hatched. It will rot. It will decay. It will be wasted. When it has to do with maturity, you must wait. There must be patience in your spirit. I pray that the patience required, the stamina required to wait while God is walking, receive it in the name of Jesus. When God forms man, they wait. The power to wait in the name of Jesus the Lord. Receive it right now. You will not take off while God is walking. You will not be like Ephraim that is half baked. You will wait. You will wait. And the work of the Spirit on your life will be perfected. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Say he that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You can't lure me into dimensions. <laughs> we must close. And so this weekend we will be in or be in Nasarawa State for another crusade. The burden 
is already on our shoulders and we will bear it. I'm happy God is speaking at this early phase of what we are doing. The Bible said it's good for a man to bear his yoke while he's young. It's also good, it's also good for a ministry to bear her yoke. Ah, ah. My God. This announcement will be more appropriate when the dancer is around. It will be more appropriate. My brother, <laughs> Pastor Owina Sunday, is about to take the boat step and to tie the knot. And so this is um, a formal announcement and an invitation to the house that on the Saturday, 16th of July, 2022, in Porter's Touch Ministry, Kanu, God's single bachelor <laughs> and servant, Pastor Winner Sunday, will be joined to our dear sister, Enona. So we are invited. And for our brethren that are in Kanu, we will make this announcement. Can you come up? Let them see you. My God. Celebrate God's servant. So you too fall in love. They were stroking me when my time. <laughs> they said, ah, we thought you say you are the other of Paul. Paul. Paul was laboring in doctrine and in the spirit. How come Paul said, don't I have the power to lead on the damsel? You say you are the other of Paul. How come you are looking for a damsel? Well, um, I'm shocked. <laughs> I thought you are only laboring with the word and prayer. So this Pastor Winner Sunday, this is a good man. This is a good man. He will tie the knot on the 16th of July and we will be there to participate with him. So when you kneel down to pray, release the word of prayer. You are led to show brotherly love. Call him to the side and give a token to him. Uh, they will drink pure water there and um, help and encourage encourage the brother so that he will know that uh, people bear one another's body so let's bear his yoke stretch your hands and pray for him it's not easy to walk the path of bachelorhood i suffered in that part now i'm enjoying my life pray for him to also enjoy his life <laughs> hallelujah father we thank you for your servant we decree that every resource required, spiritual, financial, for this event to be a success is released in Jesus' name. We decree that the progress will be flawless. The program will be flawless. We decree that your hand will be upon everyone that will participate, even those who will travel. They will be preserved. No one will be endangered on account of participation in the name of Jesus. And we decree that the foundation of your home is blessed. The Lord himself is the rock upon which this house is built. And it will be from glory to glory. As one man, you chase the thousand. Now you are becoming two. You will put ten thousand to flight in the name of Jesus. So let it be written. And so let it be established in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Congratulations. At the end of the service, shake hands with him. Congratulate him and encourage him. And also don't forget, pray for the crusade. Give to us the crusade. And if you are disposed to be present for the crusade, you can connect with Pastor Victor and we'll put modalities together to see how God will bring yet and again a, a huge number of people into his kingdom. Thank you for coming. See you on Sunday. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, Make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that 
when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.